This video describes the Blueprint Keypad UI Marketplace content. What is the Blueprint Keypad UI? It's a UMG HUD for when you want to enter numerical input in particular to match a four digit code that might be used in your game for something like a cracking safes or opening lockers or accessing an ATM or just a door with a password. When you play the game, you're able to set hint actors that will prompt the player for a given keypad name. Here's the UMG layout. Um, you can see that there's some animation for the buttons and there's some dynamic text fields that get populated. Oh, some of the blueprint there for making it work, at least the UI part. When you start off, there's a keypad blueprint actor you need one of these in the scene. You place terminals which go along with any models that you might have for terminals or locks. It's triggered by player proximity. And you have hint actors where you place solutions to the kiosks in the game. So just to recap, um, this is a utility blueprint. It's not very flashy, but it will save you time making some nice functionality that you might use quite frequently if you want a pin code system with a nice UI. What will you get? Well, this is entirely constructed in the editor, so that means it's fairly easy to use and adapt. It can save data, so as players succeed in their pin code entry, the next session it'll remember what they put. You can randomize pin codes, which is good in cases where you don't want players to share the results to each other, or you can set the values to be static so that they can. The system uses a data table asset in Blueprints, which is essentially a spreadsheet in the editor, but you can also import from a CSV file the data, which is based on a very simple code name, code value or pin uh, pairing, so you can easily add more or edit what's there. The system does not impact on base classes like game state or character or controller or game mode, so you can easily add it or migrate it to existing projects. What do you have to do to use this? Well, all you need to do is place the provided keypad blueprint actor in your scene, just one of those, and then you place for each entry in your data table a hint actor and a keypad actor and you have to name the keypad actor to match the data table. How does it work? You fill up code names and code pins in the data table. On game launch, those are fed into a massive array, or they're loaded into um, the array if you've already saved your game. And then the data is sent to the actor in the scene. Uh, codes stored in the array are slightly scrambled at runtime, or they can be if you want, so per session they're never the same. You should make sure there is an equal amount of place actors to match all the levels, keypad terminals, and pin code hints. Um, for example, you could not have three pin code hint actors and five terminals. Things would start to get messy. Um, naming the terminals is probably best done by hand um, by a designer because it will be very specific from game to game or level to level. When the game runs, touching a terminal will pop up a keypad UI which expects the unique code from the array. How does it save data? Um, the actor has a struct array, and that's all that gets saved, and it contains the data table information and the, um, some booleans for whether a particular line has been completed. Uh, when you start the game, if those values exist on disk, they'll get loaded and update over the scene defaults. This just uses the save and load functions that come in the Blueprint system. So here we are in Unreal. The scene looks very empty. Um, all of the default stuff is sort of turned off. The atmospheric fog and the sky sphere are set to non-rendering. The game mode for the world is the default. You're essentially a floating camera. You can see that there's a keypad Blueprint actor which is literally just text and then all the functionality is hidden away. You need one of these in the scene and it can go anywhere. 
Next up, you place terminals, and these are set, they're triggers, but they're set to a render in the viewport, and they have a label which gets populated with the name of the keypad, and uh, you have to give them a name, which is the same as in the data table that you'll use. So the data table is an asset which builds a list with matching names and key pins. The default is 000, and you'll notice that's not set to scramble. So it'll always be 000, it won't have any random offset. You can add more easily by going plus and typing in a row name. The pin number is a string. It's easier to use a string because if you have a value like 000, zero, zero as an integer, it'll get collapsed to just one zero. So let's say um, and close it down. Now we can add a new terminal or we can copy one that's already there. And the terminal in the content browser, the whole project in one folder has audio icons and the blueprints. So we could grab the in this case the trigger keypad and drop it in the scene or we can duplicate one that's there and make sure you name it with the name that's in the data table and then we have they're backwards but we have the hint actors and these guys will kind of serve as locators or prompts for what is the solution to a given terminal you see it says pending that's because the names for these are populated dynamically when the game starts. You can override it if you want to say I must have this solution actor right here in the scene so the player will always come to this location for that particular one and you just enter the name that you want. So again we can dra uh, alt drag it or we can go find the actor I think it's this one or that's the widget must be this one and place it in the scene that's quite far away there. Uh, so. Uh, uh, see if we get the power at the same. There we go. That'll do. Um, uh, and we can either enter the name or we can let it populate the name. So all the ones that are not called something will fill up based on what's in the data table. <coughs> okay. Let's uh, play it and see what we get. Um, oh, first thing to notice is that this is heavily based on saving data. So if we have already got a safe game uh, data and we add in more to our data table, this is not something that happens in the shipped game. The shipped game has set values and you don't add more. So uh, when you're developing, you have to remember to keep cleaning the saved data if required. So let me just open up that. Okay, um, your saved data for a given project lives inside of the project folder under the saved folder and then in the save games, you can see there's already one there. So this would, if we were to add a new terminal, this would mess with the, um, the game because it would load what's in here. It wouldn't know what to do with the new one. So we'll start from scratch. Um, so we now have an extra terminal and we can go play. And uh, you can see that it shows up in the game's hanger and we have a, a hint for hanger. Uh, let's go and see him. It says it's 4529 fine and then we can run over to the hanger notice that the the labels will face towards you which makes life a little easier when you're in an empty scene like this when you touch it you get a pin code popping up and you can enter some values so if you enter the wrong value it'll tell you if you enter a value and decide to change your mind you can clear it if you enter part of a value and press OK, it'll tell you you need to keep going. Um, I've actually forgotten what that value was, so let's just go find it again. 4529. And we can type in 4529, and we get the correct answer. You see it now says open, and we run over it, it says access granted. So you never have to do twice. Whoa. You never have to do twice what... Um, uh, you've already done. The nice thing about this as well is when you run over the hint, it'll also say access granted because you've done it. If we were to close the game, what we'd want is for this to be in the state that it's in now. 
right, safe so that you don't have to keep opening this hand. So let's stop the game and we'll just press play again. And this is like we could close the editor down and so on and uh, it'll still be there. And go play. And uh, you see hanger is open in the next game. This is because in our safe data there's a, a bunch of properties in here for hanger that gets saved out. There's the number there. Now this is why you might want to have scrambling of the numbers so that per session you can't copy the, the number out of the file to figure out what the saves all are. Um, for each time you play it, this would be um, unique. So in the safe game, for example, let's say it's the, this is 8123 for the safe, I think, or one, one of those. And um, when we go play, play game, um, you'll see that the safe's hint is something completely different because it's scrambled with an offset from the initial number and then the terminal is expecting that number with the same offset so it would be like that you can hide and show the numbers and press ok and there's your access granted so that'll save as well every time you open a terminal and there's a query value it saves that value um, you'll notice when you roll over the terminal uh, will open up the keypad that there's animation on the keys and nice sounds and uh, when you type in the numbers incorrectly you're, remind, you're prompted and you get a sound. To close the terminal you just click off an empty space. Those are just big invisible buttons and uh, that's all there is to it. The system is designed to be very lightweight so that you don't have to carry a lot from project to project. There's a font for the text. Uh, there's a ground material, but actually I've deleted the ground as well, so technically I could delete that. Um, there's some audio files for the UI. Um, some of the user interface sounds have got randomized content inside of them, so there's like two or three um, different sound bites that get you know slightly filtered. And then icons for the backgrounds of the buttons, so the rollover states and click states, and then the blueprints. There's a widget for the keypad. And there's a widget for the hint, and there's a widget for access granted, um, which is really just some pop-up text. Um, there's a blueprint for managing all the values and orchestrating the saving and loading. There's the hint blueprint for taking uh, all of the different hints and giving them the correct value. And likewise, a uh, trigger blueprint for the terminal. And that's all there is to it. I will mention one last thing is that the blueprints are nicely commented and have some debugging information. You might have noticed during the gameplay that a bunch of random integers ran down the screen at the start. Those will be turned off in the release, but they're there still. So you can track what's happening. You can watch values for you know the, the codes as you play through. You can use the debugs to see what's going on. The blocks of comments are designed so that the events primarily run down the, the major axis of the canvas and they are spaced in a way that flows reasonably well. There's no crazy overlapping of nodes and as much as possible everything flows from left to right except where there's a break or some kind of loop. There's actually very few loops in this system. There's a little bit of mathsy stuff with the the pins, but it's minimal actually. Some of the maths is broken off into uh, separate functions, uh, you know, for mass organization. There's an interface between the keypad blueprint and the key code and blueprint, and I believe the trigger so that you know they can send values back and forwards. You shouldn't have too much of a hard time to understand what's happening with the blueprints. The comments kind of are clear and reasonably straightforward. Anything to do with a success or a save is marked in green. Uh, there's no level blueprint script, so nothing in there to worry about. You might kind of look at this keypad and think, well, maybe I could use it for 
a phone instead of a passcode. Or maybe I could let the user set a password rather than enter an existing password or pin code, um, which is all reasonably straightforward to um, base off of this example. So I hope you enjoy it. For the minimal cost, I'm sure you can sense that it saves quite a few hours of setting things up and testing that things work well.